Part two. Yeah. So what happens to the nervous system when we find ourselves in a, in a, in a context that's unfamiliar? How do, I mean, how many people feel gravity in their body right now? Good, that's good. You know, I don't feel it that often, sometimes, but you know, there's a lot of this stuff I don't feel every day. And some of this stuff I don't feel at all, but anymore. But, uh, but I do think there's a reason that many people don't feel this kind of stuff. And it has to do with, with the context we're living in. Also, it has to do with the physiological fact that we have the ability to shut down the vagus nerve. This is normal. We're supposed to be able to shut it down. Feeling stuff that intensely when a lion is ripping off your arm isn't great, because then you just get too overwhelmed, and you freak out, and then he eats your whole body, and then you're just screwed. So, so being able to shut it down so you can run away is a really important function. Sorry to be like so violent with my image. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a problem. Um, <laughs> So, so we have, this, and, and there's, there are such things called ganglia, and this is entirely speculative on my part. I don't know that this is true at all. But it sure looks to me like these lumps in our nerves are there for something, extra nerves there for something, right? Um, and they also happen to be at intersections in the nerves. And it sure looks to me like these ganglia are what basically directs the flow of nerve signals, right? So it doesn't matter whether or not this is true. It's, it's definitely a fact that we have the ability to shut down the parasympathetic nervous system and get all jazzed up into the sympathetic, which is called the fight, flight, freeze response. Everybody knows what that is, um, right? Okay. But the point is that stress is supposed to be temporary, very short term, right? Because when you're stressed out and you're out of your vagus nerve, you're dysregulated, and you're burning energy intensely, you're burning out, you're, you know, you're like a you're like a 100-watt bulb on a 1,000-watt you know, voltage. It just burns out. Um, we don't want to be there much at all. Um, without the vagus, we also lose the flavor and the intensity of the senses. You know? We lose connection to here, and that's on purpose. right? But it's only supposed to be temporary. So um, I'm sure there's stuff I'm leaving out, but let's move on. So we're talking about stuff that disconnects the vagus. Right? How could the vagus get disconnected? Well, the first thing was we just said we have the physiological ability to shut it down. But we also are born into a physical environment and a social structure that's very different from a tribal hunter-gatherer structure. I mean, first thing, I mean, you, you, you're born and you're expecting dirt floors and, you know, <laughs> people around you're expecting to, to be put on your mother's belly and have a breast and smell her scents and and feel that instant bonding, this is the kind of thing you expect. You expect bases around you, you expect the tribal context that, that for hundreds of thousands of years we've always come into. That's how your nervous system evolved in that context. Instead, when you're born and you're snatched away from your mother and they cut your umbilical cord and put you in a cold stainless steel scale and they spank you and hold you upside down and then they cut off the foreskin of your penis or whatever horrible things they do to you, you know, um, these are all completely unexpected, right? And all of them deeply, almost like in, just impossible to feel. Like each one of those things is, is an electric jolt to your nervous system. It's like, what is going on? This is not normal, right? And it only gets worse from there, right? So, that, so there you are, then you're, you're, you're living in a, in a house and there's rugs underneath you that smell like formaldehyde and there's bars around you of your crib, and you're in a separate room from your parents, you can't feel or smell people around you, you know? You can't even see the moon, you know? You can't see stars. This is very different stuff. Um, even like we're saying, the, the, the motor of a ref refrigerator going on constantly, it's going to be sort of constantly agitating your organs. They're going to be jiggling constantly. Just with that small little vibration, the subsonic vibration, of a refrigerator, you know, if your mom happens to be, you know, watching a lot of soap operas and chain smoking and ignoring you, you know, all of those things are going to be very strange and you're going to imprint on all those things, right? Like, this is how mom shuts out, I guess I got to shut down, you know? Um, if you are drinking from rubber nipples instead of real nipples, you know, it's going to feel very different, smell very different. Very different sensations. Um, so, so in addition to the fact that we can shut the vagus nerve down, we also 
can we also are, are sort of confronted with an environment that's that's very unfamiliar and unexpected. On top of that, okay. So on top of that, we have a culture that really, that really, um, whose main product and whose main tenet is avoiding visceral sensation. Most of what we do, most of what we produce um, in our country and in the West in general takes us out of here and gives us false sensations, sensations for what we're missing. I mean, the best consumer is somebody with a big hole in the nervous system that they're constantly trying to fill up with something, right? They're trying to replace the real feelings they're missing. Um, and so our economy really runs on this. And it's critical to our, our survival as a nation that our economy keep running. And so, so we develop this culture that really encourages visceral disembodiment. One of the main ways we disembody is just not to breathe. I mean, most people, you guys are mostly yoga teachers, right? How many students do you have coming in that can't breathe? That even after six months or two years of class, still won't breathe. I mean, this is a great way to shut down the nervous system. When your diaphragm doesn't move up and down, your organs don't get squished. Let's everybody do it. Everybody take one hand to your belly, one hand to your heart, and close your eyes. And just take several deep, full breaths, as relaxed, as full as possible. Now, let's take breaths even deeper, even fuller. In fact, take one hand to your belly and one hand behind your belly to your back body. See if you can take so full an inhale with so soft a belly that you actually feel your organs stretch at the end of your inhale. And then exhale so completely that you feel your organs squish and squeeze like you're wringing out a sponge at the end of your exhale. And again, as deep, as full, as stretchy an inhale as possible. And then as long and as emptying and as squishing an exhale as possible. You're looking for the sensation that happens at the fullest inhale and the emptiest exhale. Okay, I'm going to do a little more work on this at the end, but I just wanted to throw that in there for now. But imagine you weren't doing that all day long. In fact, imagine you were taking tiny little shallow breaths. Let's all take a tiny little sip breath. And see how different it feels. See how little you feel, right, below your sternum. Just a tiny little sip breath, like a bird. It's immediately agitating, immediately disconnecting, isn't it? Okay, so, but in addition to not breathing, we can also watch TV, we can go shopping, we can take any kind of drugs, anything can function as a drug, so long as it distracts you from this, so long as it takes you out of here. And remember, we're doing stuff. That's, it's natural to imprint on the world around you. It's natural to um, do what your parents do. It's natural to do what everybody around you do. In fact, you can't help it. You resonate, you know, neurologically, viscerally, vaguely, with how everybody else's nervous system is, is functioning. So all these things work together, you know? And so what we have here in our culture is sort of a snowballing effect. But instead of the benign, benevolent snowballing effect of healthy grown-ups raising healthy kids, we have a sort of dirty snowball effect of unhealthy grown-ups in an unhealthy culture raising disconnected kids who then in turn raise disconnected children. So this is our culture, this is our environment. We're we doomed. We're, no, we're not. We're not doomed. In fact, it's great that we work this way. It's really wonderful we work this way. We'll get up. Okay, but we are doomed a little bit because 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 here is the bad news. This is the worst part. Okay, the worst part is this. When and I'm really going to have to rush it through here. So the worst part is this. When you um, have caregivers who are not hooked up and they cannot feel you, okay, they are capable of doing things that really affect you very badly, right? And I'll just give you one example. Imagine there's a guy living in the Kodan somewhere, and he has a girlfriend, he gets her pregnant, 
28-year-old guy. He wanted to be an actor, right? But now he's got a kid. And he does the right thing, and he's a man, and he marries a woman, and, and they, he raises a kid, and he's really a good guy, and he's really doing his best. But there's some small part of him that, that really wishes and aches to have been able to follow the life where he moved to New York and became an actor, which is what he wanted to do. So what happens under those circumstances? Remember, this is a really good guy who's trying to do a really good dad, right? So he's doing everything right. But there's that little part of him that thinks, and, and it's kind of like a little kid, right? Matt, you know how little kids think? They're like, if their mom says you can't have the ice cream, they throw a fit, I hate you, mom, I wish you were dead. I, then I can have the ice cream, right? <laughs> little kids are like that. Very simple solutions to problems. If mom or dad, I can have ice cream, right? So if, you know, there's many generations of people that have been raised sort of incompletely and have sort of these disconnected little children, and those little children still think that way. Still very simple thought processes. So if my daughter weren't here, I could move to New York and be an actor, right? So that's what that guy's got going on at some small level of him. Now, what happens when his daughter, two or three years old, as incredibly sensitive, intuitive, and perceptive as all human beings are, especially when they're young, and they haven't learned how to shut this stuff down, right? She's feeling and maybe perceiving his desire for her not to exist. What can she do with that? I mean, what a terrifying thing to perceive. What it really, an impossible thing to perceive. So what she does is she takes that perception, she wraps it up in the parts of her nervous system that were perceptive and sensitive enough to, to feel that, and she buries it, okay? And this is how you create a sub-personality. This is called dissociation. This is a well-known phenomenon in psychoanalytic circles. Um, but the key point for me is that that part of her nervous system that she buried was the most perceptive, sensitive, intuitive part. So really the best part of her, really, you know? And on top of that, that part of her, that most powerful part, is kind of infected with the agenda to destroy herself, essentially, okay? Because daddy didn't want her to be there, right? So through no fault of dad's, this is not his fault. He has natural, normal desires to do stuff, and he's trying to raise his kid. We're not talking about a terribly abusive, terrible family kind of thing. We're talking about normal good people doing good stuff, right? But still creating in this young body a part of her nervous system that has the agenda to not exist herself, okay? Um, it's kind of an extreme, maybe disturbing example. I don't mean it to be. But you see this all the time in real people around you, right? Why is that person so self-defeating, blah, blah, blah? It's because of this kind of stuff, I think. Um, so what happens when, you, when, when you're imprinting on the world around you and adjusting and adapting your nervous system that way is that you create sort of a three-tiered structure. You have a, and this is not the, an ideal picture, but my son liked it, so I put it up. But it doesn't give you the three-tiered effect. But you basically have a top layer that's your conscious self. That's the part of us that we're all, you know, acting with all the time. The normal self, the real self that we think we are, right? Underneath that, subconscious, unconscious, buried, submerged, and infected with bad agendas because we, you know, imprinted on and noticed and observed and perceived sort of negative either treatment or wishes on the part of our caregivers. So we got these, this, this, this unconscious inner child part that's kind of malevolent and also really powerful, smarter than our front self, right? Underneath all that, buried under all those bodies, is our real self, you know, our spirit, whatever you want to call it, but our true self. And that's, that's how I see this sort of three-tiered structure. But the, the main point is that middle section, that dangerous section, you know, can be very effective. Um, it's kind of like having a, an unruly classroom with, with one sort of inept teacher and 29 hooligans and one quiet, smart kid in the back, you know? But 